Thumbs up if you can. Great. Okay. We're starting. We're starting laying down, as I've told the rumors. That's the people in the room. They're not uh, fictitious stories that are going around that may or may not be true. They're just people in the room, the rumors. So we're laying on our backs. Soles of the feet on the floor. Legs bent, therefore. Lower back released, thereby. Diaphragm released as a consequence. And the more you let your lower back go, the more you'll feel that diaphragmatic release and the more your breath will open up. Huh? So that's pretty simple, straightforward and hopefully enjoyable. Just to repeat, legs on the backs, legs bent, soles of the feet on the floor. Now you can place your hands where you like, upper chest is a good suggestion. But when you place your hands on your upper chest, there's often a need to move the elbows several times. Uh, and as a consequence, move your shoulder blades several times. There's a sense in which you're walking the shoulder blades away from the spine, especially at the bottom edge of the shoulder blade, the bottom inner edge. So that's the edge sort of uh, nearest the spine, but a uh, bit lowest down, furthest from the head. So you do it as many times as it feels right. For me, I, you know, it's getting the hand position right is to do with elbow movement and shoulder blade movement. And then neck relaxed, lower back relaxed, scalp relaxed, shoulder blades themselves relaxed. And of course, whether you're zooming in or whether you're rooming into the Brighton Buddhist Center, it's an easy place to relax. It's uh, suffused with sunlight and uh, it's got loads of very pretty Buddhist imagery, imagery around. And so it's perfect really, you know, zooming in or rooming in. Now flex up your hips, that means lift up your feet. Give your legs a little hug, pretty simple. So you just wrap your arms around your shins and you can roll around a bit if you want. Rolling can feel pretty uh, excellent. <laughs> So rolling to one side, you might find a release that feels uh, impossible to describe with words, but absorbing is an attempt. <laughs> and you sort of disappear. The experience itself from a sort of subjective point of view is wordless. And that's the feeling, isn't it? And many moments are wordless and they're magical. One of my favorite moments from a movie is Jodie, Jodie Foster in the film Contact, which was based on a book written by uh, the famous Carl Sagan, scientist. And she sort of, well, without giving the whole sort of story away, she, she appears in the middle of beautiful uh, astronomical events like Nebula. And she just says, there are no words. They should have sent a poet because she can't speak, but of course it's Jodie Foster's very, very good acting. <laughs> and it's very moving. So it's like that, that, that sort of, you can't grasp it in words, it's so rich. And the experience, you know, if we described it in words, it's, it's not, you know, rolling on the back, it sounds mundane, doesn't it? But the truth is, it's a way of connecting as anything can be to the field that everything is part of, everything is part of the field. That's a sort of scientific way of putting it. Particles, ultimate identity is a field. Electrons are particles, but they're true or ultimate identity is the electron field, for example. We think of ourselves as particles, me, myself and I, but our true identity is part of an interdependent field that we're all part of. And so we're all creatures and so are the planet. And of course, we're realizing that um, you know, very, very clearly more and more. When you're ready to release, then you release and you place your feet back on the floor and take a breath or five or eight or any other number that you happen to breathe. And then go ahead and raise a leg, any leg. That one's a good choice because you've, you've only got two, presumably. So we'll do the other one after. Uh, interlace your fingers behind the thigh of the raised leg. Just near the back of the knee, but not on the back of the knee. 
And you can feel your hand pressing into your thigh and your thigh pressing into your hand. And there's a sort of rebound, the sort of neither's winning, the hand isn't pushing the thigh forwards and the thigh's not pushing the hand backwards. So where's the energy going? Well, it, it re-arises somewhere else, usually in the front of the leg as warmth or tingling or buzzing or fizzing. And then you guide that energy up through the leg from the shin towards the pelvis. As if you're imagining you're, you're like combing it, brushing it, stroking it repeatedly. You never hold your breath in, in, in yoga. Well, that's a lie. <laughs> you never uh, subconsciously accidentally hold the breath in, in yoga. Or even that's a lie. Um, when we're practicing the asanas, let the breath flow as the mind flows, unless otherwise instructed, or unless there's a spontaneous breath retention, which would be an indicator that your mind has become completely still. Okay, that's the truth. Okay, bring that leg down. Take a breath, deep breath in and of course out. Take a few, they should be audible. They should be indicative of a release of a sort of arrival, of a sort of beginning at least of letting go of all the things that we are sort of tethered to in the past and in the future, both of, both of which are imagined events anyway. Uh, raise up your other leg when you're ready. Obviously, we could discuss whether or not the past and the future are imagined events, but after uh, a good amount of reflection, it's not that difficult to see uh, that that's true. So uh, it's not that the past didn't happen, it's just that our memory of it isn't it. <laughs> and of course, the future hasn't happened, so that's straightforward. So <laughs> pressing the thigh into the hand and the hand into the thigh, any other movements that are intuitive to you, of course, you know, you can let your leg move medially, you can let it move laterally, the breath should be uh, expressive, the jaw should be very soft, hand into the thigh, thigh into the hand, and then there's that energy, it just arises because energy can't disappear. It has to transform. This is uh, one of the, there's the rules of uh, Newtonian physics. The energy carries on unless it's deflected and all that stuff, Newtonian stuff. So where does it go? If your thigh isn't pushing your hand back and your hands aren't pushing your thigh forward, it's gotta go somewhere. There it is popped up, top of the shin or in the knee as tingling, as warmth, as sensation, as awareness. And then you guide it with gentleness and with free flow breath. If your breath goes shallow, it indicates that you're approaching this the wrong way. You're approaching it by picking up a tool that's the wrong tool. So this, this sense of me, myself and I is a construct and it's constructed for a reason to be used as a tool for planning. <laughs> like a map is a tool, but it's not the territory. The map isn't the territory. It's just a pointer to it. So once you're on the territory, you've got to wake up to the territory. You can't rely on the map entirely. Otherwise you'll be, you know, crashing into things and falling over things. And, you know, there's, there's a living reality there. So similarly, with this sense of self, which, we, you know, I am trying to understand yoga. What's Jim saying? Do I understand that it's not for you or me or the I? You know, just like swimming isn't for the I or, you know, disappearing to some flavor you like isn't for the I. They're for disappearing. And in that disappearing, you re-arise in, in a natural, open ability to respond to the moment. Okay, I think that's a great simple stretch. Bring the leg back down uh, when you're ready. Take another deep breath or two or three. Pop your hands underneath your head with your fingers interlaced as if you're on a holiday or, or beaming into a holiday. So, you know, as if it was a sort of long bank holiday and it was sunny and it was a seaside town and perhaps you were in 
a tranquil place like a Buddhist center and there was no one else in there apart from yogis. And that would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> so, you could imagine that. And also then realize, of course, that's exactly what is the truth. So we can just enjoy this moment, you know, the Brighton Buddhist Center, zooming into the vibe or rooming in directly. It's, it's, everything you need is already here. There's a school of Buddhism called Dzogchen, which is a Tibetan word, and it just means, kind of means, it literally means the great perfection, but kind of means everything you need is, it was already done. It's like, what are you reaching for? You know, it's the reaching out that distracts us from the wholeness, the completeness, the liberation that is now. It's liberative because it's already whole. It's liberative because it's interdependent by nature. Lift up your feet when you're ready. Good job. Lower back can come up to bring your elbows and knees towards each other, flexing your abdominals, thereby. Your hands can be higher or lower as you like. This is uh, isometric contraction following concentric contraction. And afterwards it's going to be eccentric contraction. And that afterwards is now. So eccentric means lowering your head slowly. That's the upper ab abdominal fibers eccentrically contracting. Then lower your feet slowly. That's the lower abdominal fibers eccentrically contracting. And then a deep breath in with a deep breath out like a sigh. And let that be the start of a few deep breaths like three, four or more. So giving is the most important asset that you and I as human beings have. It's the most important asset. Without giving, without the ability to give to the way things are, then we're in tremendous pickles of all kinds. As we know, we've all been in tremendous pickles many times. But giving is the solution so much so that in Buddhism, and it's hard not to reference Buddhism when there's this enormous Buddha uh, next to me, uh, in Buddhism, in Mahayana Buddhism, the perfections that are practiced by a practitioner of that school start with giving, right? So what can you give now? We give to the moment. You know, the way the body's unfurling itself, the way the breath's breathing itself. Let's flex up again, same thing. Lift up the feet first, then the head, elbows and knees towards each other. They don't have to reach. You can adjust your hand position anywhere. You don't want to feel like you're yanking on the neck. The hands can be higher or they can be lower. They can be on the neck or the, or the scalp or the back of the head. They can be interlaced or much looser, hold, whatever suits your neck. And then slowly the upper body comes down, followed by slowly the feet coming down again. This is eccentric contraction. And then once the feet are down, you take a deep breath in with a deep breath out like a sigh. Mm. Quite deliberately and just letting go like, you know, as if this was enough. Because <laughs> this is enough, because what we want is liberation. It, however we manifest our wants, you know, we, we sometimes manifest it by trying to get bigger houses or, you know, more friends or more likes on social media or you know, retroactive approval from our parents, even if they're not alive anymore, you know, et cetera. But we're still all reaching for the same thing, which is this sense of satisfaction, completeness, and feeling like you belong. Now that doesn't happen by, unfortunately we're misguided, it doesn't happen by gripping, grasping, grabbing. It happens through giving. So there's three G's and there's a fourth one. And the fourth one is liberation. And the first three are the wrong direction. We normally go through the first three, gripping, grasping, grabbing, before we end up with the last one, giving. Release your hands from behind your head. Good job. Switch your arms straight up towards the ceiling and you can wiggle your fingers and wave your arms. Obviously uh, the nerves that move, um, innovate the fingers uh, actually start as all the nerves do in the spinal region. So as you move your arms, you're moving your shoulder blades, you're moving your spine, you're moving the origin up in the brachial plexus of nerves of the three main nerves that run down to the fingers, the radial, uh, medial and ulnar nerves. 
So just move around intuitively and then begin to stretch your arms over your head towards the floor. Now moving your arms gives you so much more movement than you, than you would have if you just tried to put them down on the floor because every time you move them, some of the extraneous fascia that binds the body together, not unusefully in, in many ways, but sometimes it's too much. Many of, a lot of that extraneous fascia will melt. So that's very, very useful. It will hydrate, it will warm, which makes fascia much more viscose. It make, makes it much more fluid as well. So movement of uh, many movements are super helpful. You know, I'd expect you probably to want to, quite a few more. So take them whenever you want them. That's lifting an arm, moving the shoulder blade, replacing it. You can do that as many times as you want, but we're also going to raise the legs up. Udva Prasrita Padasana. So we've got the arms over the head on the floor. We've moved them and we can move them again if we find it useful. And you probably will. And then we're raising the legs straight up. <clears throat> Some people, including mythological people like Jim Taran, find it useful to swing the legs because uh, it stretches the lower back and it's one chain of tissue through the feet and the back of the legs and so on. So good ways to avoid things like plantar fasciitis is to stretch the whole back of the body, including the hamstrings, because it's one thing, you know, what happens to one part happens to it all. One part becomes tense, it all becomes tense. So swinging the legs might help you stretch bits of the lower back as well as the back of the legs, as well as the right down to the feet. It even will benefit your neck. You can also wag your tail, you can bend and extend, you can move your feet. This all helps the fluidity. So bending, extending, one at a time, both together, swinging. It is a huge variety of possibilities. And we can still move the arms too, if we want. So anything goes as long as whatever it is, is conducing to a feeling of coming together, right? You don't have to worry, do I look right? Do I, you know, that's not important. Do I feel right? That is important. That's the only thing that's important. So through this process, eventually we'll end up with the legs up in the air, feeling more integrated rather than just up in the air and being held despite resistance. And then from that position, we're gonna lower the legs back down to the floor, keeping them relatively straight, keeping the lower back very, very close to the floor throughout the descent. You go at any pace, and once you're down, everything melts. Right? You let your elbows bend, you let your legs fall. So you wanna be as melted as you like humanly can be. <laughs> So let the body position, you know, just adjust it until it feels good. Bend the legs when you're ready. So the feet come onto the floor and roll over onto your side. It doesn't matter which side. And then lay on your side. Actually, I say it doesn't matter which side. It does. Uh, lay facing this way. <laughs> oh. It might not matter at home if you're zooming, though. Um, it depends which way you've got the screen set up. Then you take the hand that's not supporting your head, extend your bottom ribs. Lots of times you push into the hand that's not supporting the head and you extend your bottom ribs. And then you extend your uh, elbow to open the armpit. So every time you lift and land your body, hopefully there's a bit more contact with the floor. And that contact is your raw material that you can then transform or can be then transformed into touch, contact into touch. So do that by now rolling around. And so you get a lot of uh, biofeedback from the body. You can roll forwards, you can roll backwards. And of course you can feel more and you can feel where you're tense and you find moments that make you breathe. <laughs> that's what you're looking for, moments that make you breathe and moments that make you smile as well, like nearly losing balance. That can be fun <laughs> too. Now, once you've rolled around for a bit, and if I'm honest, I could roll around for quite a bit. Then we take the next station is to play with the top leg, moving it between the horizontal and the vertical planes back and forth. 
Again, we're hydrating myofascia, posh way of saying the fascia that makes the structure of the muscles and surrounds the muscles. We're not just hydrating myofascia, but all fascia. We're also melting its strenuous fascia. We're also bringing more uh, warmth to the fascia, which makes it more viscose. So you just get more uh, compliance happening, really. And gradually, over time, in your own time, we're going to bring the leg to the upright. But it should be... Uh, uh, integrated so you know you don't want to try and keep up you're like oh god everyone else has got their leg up right I, I better hurry up or it, that shouldn't be it's about it, the journey is very much internal um, sometimes we use the word pratyahara coming from two words prati um, plus ahara which means uh, <clears throat> turning away from food <laughs> ahara means food but food means external um, food, as in like validation or affirmation externally. We turn away from that in pratyahara. When you're ready, you can hold your big toe. Try and take your hand to your toe more than you take your toe to your hand. And once you got it, that can be enough, actually. And you can play and you can breathe. This is number one, because you've got no, that's your compass your breath, it tells you, are you using the right tool or the wrong tool? You now, sieves and hammers are both tools, aren't they? And but try banging a nail in a wall with a sieve. It's useless. Try, you know, sieving your flower with the hammer. <laughs> so similarly, you're using the self when presence is required instead of a planning modality. Yeah. So to, to avoid picking up the wrong tool, make sure the breath flows. Do whatever helps the breath to flow. Instead of the kind of shallow breath that's indicative of doubt, that's indicative of grasping. <laughs> the leg can extend if you want, or rebend if it, you know, whatever feels right, investigative, um, breath-centered movements. And of course, movement does help a lot. Um, but without the breath, you don't really have any guide. It's like um, trying to navigate without a compass or without a map. But you have the breath, so that's good. You always got it. So if it flows, you know you're in the presence mode, which is super spontaneous. It has no doubt. Right? The, the other mode of self is full of doubt. I don't know what Jim's talking about. What? Do I understand this? Maybe I don't. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I don't get yoga. You know, that's doubt. Doubt indicates only one thing. Not that you're not clever. Not that you don't know. Not that yoga is a mystery. But that you've picked up the wrong tool. Just like if you're dancing and you, if you, you don't let go of thinking, then the dancing is no fun. <laughs> okay. So think of this like dance. Bring your leg down, head down, knees up, and come up. Nice and easy. And then swing round to the second side, which I'll conveniently call side two. And similarly, placing your head in your hand, extending your bottom ribs multiple times with a clear purpose. There, I have heard yoga teachers sometimes say there's no goal to yoga, there's no purpose to yoga. It's complete nonsense. <laughs> They're very clear goals, very clear purposes to practice. And the main goal is absorption, samadhi. We know that We're just reading Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, for example. But it's not just Patanjali, it's many other traditions too. So samadhi, we can think of as absorption. So extending, extending your ribs, extending your armpit, and then rolling. And to get into presence is like getting into a kiss, like getting into a hug, like getting into dancing, like getting into a warm bath on a cold day with the door locked and some lavender in the water. Or like getting into anything, you know, or like sipping coffee in the morning, a first sip. You know, when people do even things that we consider mundane, they're actually already yogic. 
just because they're often quick and then we we don't notice how yogic they've been. So most people at one point in the day enjoy a moment of something, enjoy their first sip of coffee, enjoy a sip of wine, enjoy a piece of chocolate, enjoy a sparkle on the ocean, you know, enjoy a kiss on the cheek. Most people enjoy something. And that enjoyment is absorption. For a moment, there is only coffee, you know, when you first first sip. So you surrender so that, you know, one's prepared to do that in so many aspects. That's what you do in yoga too. You give. Mm -hmm. Now we could roll like this, I'm sure, for, you know, plenty of time. We're going to bring the top leg up and play uh, (laughs) with it back and forth between the horizontal and vertical planes with the purpose to bring everything together. We, in Vajrasati Yoga, and we sometimes talk about agreement, bringing everything into agreement, kind of do it, doffing our cap, as it were, to the word Om, um, which kind of means agreement. It means I assent, I agree, or may it be so, or it is so, or this is the way it is. This is always agreement, Om. It's a very, very positive um, bija, um, bija mantra, seed syllable. So keep playing, breathing, and gradually bringing the leg over time in a way that is integrative. It'd be silly to practice something that's called yoga if you weren't practicing it in an integrative way because yoga means integration. <laughs> So don't leave any fibers, you know, spend as much time as is required. Do whatever, you know, let go of whatever until you're given, like to your coffee, like to the smell of a rose, like to a hug, like to whatever, you know, laying in the grass. Hold your big toe when you're ready. Try your best to practice another one of the perfections. I mentioned one of them is giving. The next perfection is called kshanti. It's one of quite an enjoyable word to pronounce in Sanskrit, kshanti. And it means uh, patience, forbearance. So once you've got hold of the big toe, there's the option to extend the leg or not. You know, no problem. You can even not hold the leg at all, you can hold the heel, you know, there's a lot of different ways to go about it, as long as it's evoking a freer modality of breathing. That's, that's all, that's the criteria here. There's so much confusion in yoga, in the modern yoga world, because people have confused the postures that we do, that we call yoga, with yoga, and therefore people don't understand yoga history, they're like, oh, and people get shocked and dismayed when they find out that nearly all the postures that we do don't exist in yoga history. (laughs) Uh, If you understand yoga correctly, then the postures are just one way. Uh, You know, your coffee is another, and a kiss on the cheek is another, just one way to merge back with the field. That stops you clinging to an individuated sense of self that causes your sense of isolation and lack of power and all the compensatory behaviors that follow. And all you got to do is give yourself to the breath, give your movements to the breath, that you move in any way that makes the breath free. You know, don't think about it, give to it. You know, do you think about dancing when you go dancing? Most people don't. In fact, most people try to knock their thoughts out of their head when they go dancing. That's why my, most dance venues have bars. There's a purpose for those bars being there because people find it difficult to dance and think. <laughs> you know, other other drugs are available at clubs as well, aren't they? Okay, and bring your leg down. So I'm told. It's been a long time. <laughs> One leg on top of the other. Drop the head. Come on up. We've been down there a while. 
So we're coming on up. We're going to sit in Dandasana, a beautiful pose. Uh, if you're in the room, so you turn your feet to face the midline. And at home, you can be anywhere you like. You can sit probably, if you've got a couple of blocks, they'd be useful. Uh, we've got purple blocks here uh, in honor of prints, but it can be any color. But ideally, they are short and short end like that. If you don't have two, one's okay, you can use one. And you're gonna have your feet facing the midline here. Um, Simon, uh, yeah, that's it. If you're in the room uh, in real life and otherwise not, or you just face wherever and you sit on those two blocks. So that's pretty simple. There's marvelous ways to do this with belts and things. Draw the buttock flesh out and back, come to the inner front edge of the sitting bones. So if you do find it hard to sit up in this pose, just a very, a very quick way to help you is to use a belt to sling it around the foot and pull. So you can try that if you want, that's a good option. Um, I haven't got a belt here, so I can't demonstrate, but you know what I mean. You put it around your feet and you pull so the back of the body goes in towards the front of the body. And that's useful if you find it hard to get that lightness and lift in your lower back, using the pull of the uh, belt against the feet to drive the back of the body in towards the front of the body and then lift the front of the body up. So whether you're using a belt to pull the back of the body in and lift the chest, or whether your hands are on the blocks and you're moving around to try and find moments of lift and lightness. I've got to say that Dundasana, this pose, in my opinion, which is correct, is <laughs> it's one of the best poses. <laughs> one of the best poses you can do for your health and well being. Because it stretches the back chain, it brings strength to the back of the body, and it helps tune us in and ways of lifting. So do your best, see if you can lift a bit higher, especially the lower back. Not too much effort, more lightness. So the lift is more like a helium balloon going up in the air, you know, it sort of floats up. In Jainism, which is a sort of contemporaneous, its foundations are contemporaneous with Buddhism, probably a bit older than Buddhism. Uh, their image of enlightenment is you get less and less karma stuck to you. It's like ballast dropping. And eventually you get so light that you float up to the highest part of the universe where you stay in eternal bliss. That's Jain enlightenment in the Jain tradition, which as I say is contemporaneous, or probably older actually uh, with Buddhism, but it comes from a similar area of India and has similar foundational beliefs, although techniques differ. So a few more breaths, looking for that lightness. Like if you were practicing Jainism and you're imagining everything heavy. Karma, uh, karma sticks to self. There you go. That's a good statement for you to reflect on. Karma sticks to self. It becomes more sticky <laughs> the more self you manufacture. I should be try, I should try to be nicer. I shouldn't think that things like this. I've got a lot to do. I'm, I'm kind, I'm unkind, anything. That makes you sticky. <laughs> Karmic particles stick to you, you become heavy. But conversely, less self, just let it all drop away. Karma can't stick if there's no self to stick to. Okay, now I've said that and uh, it's out there and it's true. And if you reflect on it for the rest of your life, it will have a profound effect on you. Uh, karma can't stick if there's no one to stick it to. Okay, now release. <laughs> and yogis dismount because it's a big pose. Now we're going to put two blocks. Uh, and if you're, at home, if you're at home, you haven't got blocks. I expect you have, but if you haven't, you can use books. Um, obviously, you might have big, thick books like encyclopedias, cookery books, Bibles, or the Majjhima Nikaya um, in the Buddhist tradition, or something like that. You're going to put them down. You're going to lay down on your back. I'll just adjust this microphone. And you're going to put those blocks very simply underneath your pelvis, your bum, by walking your feet in and just put them underneath your pelvis, underneath your bum, with your tailbone just off the end. It's definitely worth getting a couple of yoga blocks if you don't have them. They don't cost very much money. I'm sure you can buy them secondhand because there's a lot of people that are quite faddish and do yoga and then they don't. And so they're probably, you know, yoga equipment 
online cost nothing. So if you don't have blocks at home, do invest in some, but you know, fine for now. Move your knees side to side, like this sort of windscreen wiper blade almost, or like a pendulum. Hopefully you've made sure your tailbone's just off the end of this. And as you move side to side, it begins to massage your lower back. Very, very useful. And you're looking for moments that are like, oh yeah, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And you might pause in those moments. We're stretching areas like the obliques, there's a, a abdominal muscles. We're stretching parts of the lower back, very useful. Now, if you've got blocks or stable books, you can optionally take them one station higher. So you'd have to move your feet in towards your bum, lift your heels up high, and then simply flip the two blocks. And again, the tailbone wants to come off the end, just about, and lift and land until it feels right. I find if I lift and land a few times, I can, I can get a position which creates a bit of traction in the lower back. A bit of traction in the lower back. And that's wonderful because everyone's lower back needs some traction. So lift and land a few times, get it right for you until you feel like, oh yeah, I can feel a stretch on my lower back. Now your hands can be placed where you like, on your hips, on your chest, on the floor, elbows in towards the uh, waist and forearms out away from the waist is an option, or even over the head, right? these different options. This is a version of Setu Bandhasana. Now, it's very unlikely, but just in the, uh, in the rare occasion that one or two of you might be very, very long-legged, very, very long torso, or very stretchy, one or two could take the blocks to their full height. Uh, so you can do that if you want, but uh, I'm five foot nine and a quarter and quite stretchy and I can do it. But so if you're shorter than me and not as stretchy as me, it's not it, probably not likely. Yeah. But if you're tall, maybe it would come you know, easy. So that's another option, having the blocks uh, at full height. Bring your chest towards your chin and chin towards the chest so they move to, together and breathe into that. It's a great stretch for the psoas and for across the inner groins. Great stretch for the intestinal area. Just great, it's just great basically. Now coming out, we we'll walk the feet back towards the derriere, derriere, the bum, and lift the heels up, take the blocks out, or after lifting the pelvis off, and then slowly walk the feet, uh, walk the bum down and walk the feet a little further from your bum, and then rest like that. You can rest again with your hands on your upper chest or hands under your head, either way, up to you, but take deep breaths. So those inhales are deep, those exhales are like size. It's one of the most, uh, I suppose I would recommend that people do regularly, you know, it's really useful. And it actually sets us up very, very well. For another pose that's very popular, doesn't have uh, much prehistory apart from in an earlier instantiation uh, as the uh, elephant pose, Gajasana. But we now know it as down face dog. So roll over onto your side, coming up from your side and onto your hands and knees. Having brought yourself to your hands and knees, we'll start actually with a moment of high heel kneeling, which is very unpopular with some people, uh, but it's very good for all people. <laughs> okay. And many, many of us hate it and loathe it. Um, for both. It's good for old people and all people. <laughs> Actually, old people are in the category of all people anyway. Yeah. So, 
So that's good for uh, everyone here at the Buddhist Centre, all of us, <laughs> and for you youngsters at home too. <laughs> okay, now lift up. <laughs> lift up your bum and you can come into downstairs, dog. And open the armpits. Breathe easy. Really pad your paws into a deeper weave with the yoga mat. Be being calmer helps a lot. We have a phrase in uh, Vajrasati Yoga, calmness conditions connection. And what we want to do is connect with every part of the body as if we were sort of suffusing the body with awareness as we stretched it. So, you know, stretch the back. If you stretch the back, it is suffused with awareness. Stretching is awareness. And there's only two things to do in yoga. Uh, yoga is awareness and then giving, you know, awareness of a rich sensation like a stretch or a kiss or a delicious flavor or, you know, something pretty in your eyes or even something un unattractive, you know. And then giving to that sensation, you know. So it doesn't have to always be pretty stuff. Often we put pretty stuff on shrines, but you don't have to. You can eventually, in Tantra, you end up putting less pretty stuff like skulls and stuff too. So you can do it through anything. Goths, of course, are very good at that, and going into the uh, field through less pretty things. Okay, come down, nice and easy. And then all the way down to your tummy, actually. All the way down to your tummy. Where you're gonna pop, prop yourself up on your elbows. And you might find it useful, I do, to just move around a bit uh, with traction. So the traction is pulling back on the arms and then moving left and moving right and stretching the tummy. It can feel good for the back, but also you can get into some really good stretches for the tummy this way. The side of the belly, that side of the belly, the middle of the belly. You can get into some really good, even delicious uh, stretches. Stretch the legs back as well, so they come closer together, even perhaps even together. And then re-stretch the tummy again. So go between those, stretch the legs back, to stretch the groins back and to bring the legs closer. Pull back on the mat to stretch the tummy. So you're stretching in two directions, key muscles like the psoas. Get stretched in two directions, the tummy towards the head and the legs towards the feet. Having done so, Simply place your hands by your midribs, and that might be enough. Having the chest lifted a little bit, not squeezing the buttocks together. This is all a useful project. You could, if you wanted, suck the tummy in and pull the chest forwards, and that will immediately make your back longer. So you suck your tummy in or pull it in, and then pull your chest forwards. Your back will feel longer. For some people, that makes them feel like they can push a little and lift up, which you're welcome to do if you want. Don't let the shoulders raise. So at first, some people find it useful to keep the elbows bent. Lift the front of the body a lot. Suck the tummy in. It's important to keep the lower back long as you come up. Lift, lift, lift. That tummy sucked in, that chest lifted up, that lower back lifted up. Breathing deep, well done. Come back down, slow and easy. One hand on top of the other. Now these kind of postures can be quite tough. But again, they're very important to do. There's not really any main contraindications. There's contraindications much more to not doing them. <laughs> because most of our problems come in our back through disc uh, compression at the anterior uh, area. Too much fascia buildup is another problem. It's, that can be antidoted uh, through this. Weak back muscles is another. So I hope that's motivation enough for you to do it again. So come up onto your elbows, forearms and wrists, stretch the tummy, stretch the legs. The more you do these two directional stretches, the more comfortable you'll feel in the pose. Legs backwards from the inner groin, tummy forwards in the middle tummy as well. All right, legs real close, tummy stretched forwards. Then hands by the midribs. Even if you don't like it, even if you think, oh, my back, it really feels it. Yeah, it's muscles working. That's all. So sometimes you get like a little soreness in the muscle, but that's just a muscle working and it's part of the process of becoming healthier. <laughs> there is the option to have the hands further forwards and lift up, but be mindful of that because that can jam the back more. I would personally prefer hands level to the ribs and then lift a little with the elbows down, but really 
get the front of the body to lift up. That's the thing that really, uh, really matters, the front of the body to lift up from the pubis. And keep, don't just be in the pose, make it active, lift up actively, lift up dynamically. Good job. Okay, come to hands and knees slowly. Let your bum raise up. And you come to hands and knees and you catch your breath there. Let there be a bit of movement left and right and so on. With the jaw soft, with the eyes soft. So just letting the back kind of um, soothe itself through movement. Soothing itself through movement. Then you're going to take, well, if you're uh, here uh, in the room with me, you're going to take the arm furthest away from the shrine and feed that towards the shrine at home. It's up to you. It doesn't matter. We're going to do both arms. But I'm feeding towards you and you're feeding towards me with your arm if you're in the studio. You got it. Otherwise, at uh, home, sorry, I don't like to, I shouldn't call it a studio. I'm going to call it what I want to call it, which is a matka. Matka is Sanskrit for um, little monastery. <laughs> it's a nicer word, I think. So one arm extended on fingertips. It's a little twist for the back muscles. It's a great stretch for the a muscle that caps the shoulders, uh, shoulder, which is the deltoid. <sighs> And a great opportunity for you, for me, for us yeah. to give totally to. It's like an, each pose is an invitation. All you've got to do is say yes to the invitation. And if you do that, it's like being taken into the arms of the mother, the mother, the goddess, which represents the field. And then when you're in the field, you're no longer in the particle, when you're no longer in the particle, all those associations with loneliness and over-responsibility and disconnection, go, they're gone. <laughs> if only the particle knew <laughs> that its true identity was just an, an excitation in a field. <laughs> Come back up when you're ready, back to hands and knees. Catch your breath, you might huff and puff and whatever. And then the other arm, you can guess what happens next. The other arm goes underneath the body the other direction. So you can do that when you're ready, including immediately and now. So go ahead, bring your arm underneath. That's it. And similarly, the other arm can extend out to fingertips. And with the arm straight, fairly straight, that will help to keep the anterior spine, anterior spine open. So that top arm ideally is straight and on fingertips, no bend in the top elbow. So walk the arm far away enough for that. And fingertips ideally, but there are circumstances that are particular to individuals at different times. So, you know, sometimes it can be difficult on the fingers, for example. So you can always, and an alternative is to put your hand on a block instead of having your fingertips on the floor to get the height that keeps the spine open. A few more deep breaths, natural breaths, and then push into your hand. Come back up, back to hands and knees. Catch your breath, wag your tail. Look for that sort of soft flow. That soft flow. And then we're going to bring our hands super close together so that our thumbs touch, just the tip of our thumbs. So your hands look like two sunrises, perhaps on Tatooine. I think there's a new program about Tatooine. That's from Star Wars, if you're not a nerd. <laughs> and that's where uh, there's a new program called about Obi-Wan Kenobi. I haven't seen it, but I've been told about it by my niece who says I should watch it. <laughs> anyway. He's on Tatooine, they've got two sons, your hands are like two sons, that's the only connection. Lift up your bum and push from front to back. Have your feet quite generously apart. So we're a bit stingy with the hand distance, but a bit generous with the foot distance when you come into down face dog. The idea of bringing the hands closer is you can sort of send energy more directly through the center of the posture, along the central channel as it's sometimes called Madhya Nadi, uh, Madhya Nadi just means middle channel, so the central channel. 
sometimes also known as the sushumna, which implies the giving of grace. Breath comes and goes, sometimes known as the avaduta as well. But get energy through the central channel as if you're opening it up. It, you can just imagine it as is running anterior to your whole spine, including the tailbone, right? So a channel that goes all the way along anterior to your spine, including the tailbone. So this whole instruction sometimes you get about people tucking the tailbone and it's not so good. It just closes the mouth of the central channel so the energy, the kundalini can't move up through it. So we don't want that. We don't want tucking the tailbone under malaki. <laughs> okay, we'll come down slow and easy. Well done, everyone. Take a breath. Sorry, but not sorry. High heel sitting, just five breaths or six if you want. So tuck your toes under, sit up high. It's for, for our benefit, you know, and it gets easier the more you do it. So but just five breaths or so. You don't have to count them. I'll, I'll uh, approximate it. And the breath is everything. Now, you could stay like that, and it would be very beneficial to do so, but you're also probably thinking, I don't want to do it. So we'll come <laughs> Oh, well done. We'll come out and we're going to use a block now. Uh, so I'm using a cork block and some people prefer a slightly lower block. And I guess it's a matter of how big your foot is and various other uh, movements to do with where your talus bone is in your foot. So you can use either. My first recommendation, if you've got it, is a brick block. You can use a book with the binding facing towards you or you can use um, a regular block. Uh, if your mat's a bit thin, you can fold the end of it over. But no, most days now we have studio mats which benefit from being thicker, but uh, lose out on being more slippery. Anyway, uh, if you need more padding for your knees, then fold your mat over, say like that, uh, for more padding. And that's, that's the way to do it. We wouldn't use a blanket for this. It's too slippery. Then we're going to ascertain our distance to the block by kneeling on our folded over bit of our mat. If you've got to, if you fold it over a bit and then place our foot on the block and it should be pushed away enough so that your standing leg is slightly sloping. Your standing leg is slightly sloping. So calling your standing leg, the bent leg, the one that's got the pressure through the floor. The uh, pelvis, the top of the pelvis, the groin is a little bit closer to the brick than the knee is, a little bit. Check that your heel lines up with your knee as well, heel to knee alignment. And then just lift your heel up. So use the block as a pivotal point, lift the heel up off the, the front leg. So it comes up and then the back of the leg will go in towards the front of the leg. That will provide the support the hamstrings need. So get used to that feeling, tune in on that feeling, maintain softly a sense of connection to that feeling as your heel drifts back down. Keep a sense of connection to that support from the back. Then stretch your arms, turn your palms, loosen your neck, raise your lead arm, that's one near your block. Inhale, exhale, come down towards your block, towards your block. Good job. Stretch up. It's a big, strong sensation, so take it slow. Breathe easy. You can just raise the arm, or some people like to bring it up and over. That's another option. The pose is called Pariyankasana which means a crossbar of a gate. What matters most is your breath. You know, if you want to benefit from yoga, if you want to be an expert yogi, you'll know, you'll understand directly what matters most here and now is your breath. Good job, super job. Come on up. Walk your knees towards each other. You can either just turn around to do the other side or open and you know, do the other side. That's what I'm going to do. Or the other side of the mat. That's fine either way. I call this the Yogi's Espresso because if you ain't woken up yet, <laughs> this definitely does it. So kneeling on the other side. Okay. I, I, can't, I mean, I say Yogi's Espresso. I've never had an espresso and I probably never should. Last time I drank coffee was in 1989. Um, 
Okay, extend your leg. Actually, yeah, that's a lie. I have drunk coffee recently, uh, but only decaffeinated. Heel to knee. And the standing leg very slightly sloping. Don't forget that. So it shouldn't slope that way. Otherwise, the groin can't open. It's got to slope this way. All right. That is to say that the groin should be closer to the block. The top of the thigh should be closer to the block than the bottom of the thigh. Heel to knee, just double check that. Again, like we did before, we're gonna lift the heel up. You got it. And feel the back of, yeah, you got it, it looks good. Those leggings look good on you as well, Simon. <laughs> Keep think, looking at them thinking, oh, you're looking good today. <laughs> well, you always look good, but you're making those look great. Back of the leg in towards the front of the leg, and then keep that sense of support as the heel comes back down, stretch the arms, turn the palms, raise the lead arm or nearest the brick, inhale, exhale. It's a big journey. Keep the back of the leg supporting. That's why we raise the heel to educate ourselves like that. The top arm either up or maybe up and over, but it's fairly unlikely. And breath is everything. So you, you breathe into it as best you're able. Eyes soft, brain soft, throat soft, tongue soft. Good. Good job. Come up. There are other ways to do this. You can, for example, use a block for your hand to come to. If it, if it feels too much pressure down this way, putting the weight through a block, that's helpful. You can also put support with another block at the back of your leg. So there's a few other ways to work on this if this is uh, tricky. Let's bring the legs back together and sit in a kneeling position for which you can put a block between the heels and buttocks. It's regular kneeling, one hand on top of the other, sitting up straight, breathing through the nose. It's called Vajrasana. And Vajra, the word Vajra has a long and interesting history. Originally the name for the weapon of Indra, which was a mace that could knock the top off of mountains. And then later, probably under Hellenistic influence, and the, the Vajra becomes a lightning bolt. And then much later, the lightning bolt is, uh, the, as a Vajra is picked up by Tantric Buddhism as a symbol of uh, complete awakeness in Tantric Buddhism. So breathing easy, jaw soft. Interlace your fingers, stretch your arms diagonally, make sure the roots of the neck are soft and raise up. Toned tummy, loose neck, soft eyes. Tummy draws in, lower back lifts up. And maybe, you know, you might be like me and find a little movement can help get more fibers involved. So I sometimes roll on the shins a bit. We want the neck to feel loose and soft. So everything, everything flows actually, it's really nice. Breath, breath, breath. Okay, slow and easy release. Rest one hand on top of the other and take a deep breath in with a deep breath out, like a sigh. And let a few of those happen. Now, if you're comfortable, we're going to, in this position, uh, we'll go ahead and do a little practice that won't last long. But if you're not comfortable, you can adjust it to any comfortable seated position. We're going to do three rounds of what's called Brahmari. Now, Brahmari means the goddess of the bees, she who is a bee. <laughs> um, some pictures of Brahmari are just like a, a woman who's just made of bees, which is kind of quite an interesting image of Brahmari. Uh, and so in this practice, uh, we make the sound, it's apparently of the female bee, although I couldn't tell you the difference between a male and a female. Apparently this is the sound of a female bee. Uh, and you can make it with Shanmukhi Mudra. So Shanmukhi Mudra, I'll show you zoomers and I'll show you rumors we'll be able to see as well. I think you cover your eyes, don't do it now because you won't see the rest of the mudra. You press your thumbs on the little cartilaginous flaps of the ears, the tragus, they're called the tragi as a plural. And that's the beginning of your mudra. Then you breathe in deep through open nostrils and out through open nostrils. That's set you up. You then partially close the nostrils for inhale and exhale. So the actual practice is hold the mudra, eyes closed, thumbs over the ears. Take a deep breath in and out through open nostrils. 
partially closed the nostrils, breathing in and out through partially closed nostrils for three rounds. The only difference between inhale and exhale, exhales are hummed like a bee. So that just looks like, sounds like, like that. And you would do that for three breath rounds. So in your own time, open nostrils first, partially closed for inhale and exhale, humming the exhales. Once you're finished, you can rest your hands on your legs and take deep breaths. Our final posture will be Balasana. That is to say the child pose. Now for many, many, many people, uh, it's good to use blocks. Uh, one for the head, one for the hands. The one for the hand should be higher than the one for the head. So if you were using brick blocks, you'd have one lower, one higher. Some people need blocks between the heels and buttocks. If you do for kneeling, which is a very valid, valid thing to do, uh, then you must have support for your head uh, as well. So a sort of minimal support, and I'm just showing you in terms of height rather than, you know, you can use a much more stable surface than this, but a minimal support in terms of height, if you had a blocks under your, uh, between your heels and buttocks would be this kind of height that I've got here. Otherwise the whole thing just feels like you're falling uh, too rapidly forwards. Some of you don't need a block between the heels and buttocks, so don't use one. Well. You might not need as much height uh, for your head, head and hands. So you can come forward slowly like that. I quite like having uh, some support for the head and hands, even if you don't need it, because it keeps a bit of anterior space uh, in the spine. What we shouldn't have is the buttocks lifted off the heels. So something should be, if, the, if that is the case, you should put something between the heels and buttocks, a blanket or a block, and slow down your forward movement so that you keep your bum resting. And that's basically, uh, that's basically that. That's balasana. Huh? So take your time, come forward slowly. Actually, rather than that, I'm just going to adjust that a little bit for you, Barbara. It's nearly, nearly, but not quite. <laughs> so I'm going to give you double luxury. So that's going to be for your feet. Yeah. And then another blanket for your shins, like that. That's it. Okay. Great. So feet. Yes, yeah, so that your, your ankles are there. Don't go back further. Yeah, there. Oh. That's it. Yeah, perfect. And then toes touching. Not overlapping, that's it. And then real slow coming forwards, very slow. Let's give you a bit more there. Good. And you can pop your hands onto the blocks when you're ready. Great. Snuck a bit more height there. A few deep breaths, make them deep. Good. Make them natural. Just lift your bum up for a second and then bring it down again. That's it. <laughs> Got you saddled up. <laughs> so deep, deep breaths, natural breaths. Imagining the groins relaxed and heavy. Coming up slow and easy in your own time. Still that sense of the groins being released. Well done, well done everyone. And we're coming into our last pose, which is Shavasana, a very popular pose with many people. It's great. Remember, I used to, when, years ago, 
I used to come and go through, and it was like going through something for me, yoga then. Uh, and I'd come because I loved corpse pose. And I'd go through an hour and a half's class just so I could get to corpse pose at the end. So make sure you're comfortable. Make sure you're spaciously placed, symmetrically placed. Shoulder blades are tucked under, palms are facing up. If the head tips back, it's worth having head support. The hand should be off the yoga mat, not on it. And then there's nothing to do except nothing, which isn't something you do. It's like abstaining from doing. So what, how, <laughs> you know, it's a kind of oxymoron because the moment we're told that we should do nothing, then we do something, we, we create a self that's supposed to be the doer of that nothing, but it is the very self-construction that is the doing that we're abstaining from. So the, the method, the way to do nothing <laughs> is to give. This is a method mentioned, as I mentioned in Mahayana Buddhism, famously it's alluded to in a different way in the famous text, the Bhagavad Gita. Which advocates doing nothing in the sense that everything you do isn't done for you. In that text, it's done for an avatar of uh, Vishnu. That is Krishna. And there are many other techniques, but giving is what it boils down to, surrender. And you can start with the obvious, the body. Give the body. The full weight of the arms and the legs and the ribs. And the head. When you're ready, bend your legs. Soles of the feet onto the floor, buttocks tucked under. Catch a couple of deep breaths. Feel the lower back completely release into the breath. Feel the lower back completely release into the breath.
When you're ready, if you're in the Buddhist center live, as it were, then roll over towards this side where you can hear my voice at home, you can roll to your left side. Then in your own time, over to your other side, laying comfortably again, knees drawn up. In your own time, start bringing yourself around. You might rub your eyes, stretch out an arm or a leg. And when you're ready to come up, bring yourself up nice and easy from the side. May the merit gained in our acting thus go to the alleviation of the suffering of all beings. Om. Thanks, rumors are coming. <laughs> Thanks, Zoomers, much appreciated. Lovely to see you. Thank you so much for your time. Hope to see you uh, in real life as well sometime for a big old squeezy hug. And uh, I'll see you very soon. Thanks for coming. All right, now. Oh, I should say actually, while I think of it, uh, I'm teaching at yoga camp, which is I think next weekend, but I will be here first and then I'll be teaching there. So if you're at yoga camp, look out for me. I'll be there as well. Thanks, gang. Bye.